This conference Hello? will now be recorded. Hello? This please. conference will now be recorded. When we talk about anatomy for MR 31, then you should have a clear concept that you're not just going to read about the anatomy of the pelvic organs. You should know about the central control, the brain circulation. Why? Because it is very important for you because uh, you will come across several patients like those who have PET. Then they, they mm -hmm. are very likely to have cerebrovascular accidents. So if you don't know about the anatomy, about the blood vessels, then you can't see the, see that where the leakage has taken place. Then going to the other parts of the brain, you know, the all higher centers. They are located in medulla oblongata, like cardiovascular system, then respiratory system. Its control is there. So you should know that uh, which mechanisms are essential for maintaining normal vital signs, normal functions in your pregnant patient. Then in the cerebral mm -hmm. cortex, you know that its circulation is very important. Several functions are controlled from there, especially and the that higher mental functions and um, then in the cerebellum the third part of the brain that is responsible for the locomotive activity maintaining balance and then our vision so then in the core brain there are important uh, structures like thalamus hypothalamus then they contain several endocrine glands then your eyes are located there so you know all of these structures are very important then coming to the Lymph nodes, they can be involved in several functions, in several cancers, in infectious conditions. So we should know about that. Thyroid is a very important structure. You know that life is not possible without a, a th normal mm -hmm. thyroid function. So hypo and hypo both conditions are dangerous for, for us. Mm -hmm. then, uh, you should know about the main blood vessels, main chambers of the heart, how pregnancy can be affected, how pregnancy is going to increase work of the work on the cardiovascular system by growth. Respiration, asthma is one condition. Then how does the normal uh, uh, respiratory function uh, helps us in oxygenation? And um, how this can be, how the changes can affect these systems. Then breast is a very important issue. You have to know about the anatomy because your, your patient can present with different anatomical lesions infections messages then uh, what changes take place because this is also a gland large gland which is modified mm -hmm. and it has been adopted for playing uh, this you know this role of lactation breast cancer in pregnancy very important condition and uh, patients will be coming to you and asking about their outcomes their possibilities so you should know about that then which uh, what are their blood supplies so then um, what about the lymph nodes, lymphatic drainage? How blood can, how infections and malignancy they can spread from one breast to another one, or from mm -hmm. other areas? Then diaphragm, the most important major muscle of respiration, 75% of the respiration is carried out to that one. Then you know that in the diaphragm you have got three openings. So which opening will contain? We will be containing which viscera? Okay. So so which uh, structures are passing through these openings, that is very important. Then you should know about, you know, brachial plexus, what, what complications can take place because nerve injuries are not limited to only these pelvic surgeries. We will talk about them also. Mm -hmm. You should know about the function of the GIT, about, about stomach, about adrenal glands, get normal renal um, structure. Then you should know about the uh, pelvic organs, pelvic vista, and the pelvic vista, which are related to the genital system, to the uro, uh, urinary system, and to the GIT. Mm -hmm. All of them are concluding there. Then mm -hmm. in the pelvic organ, you should know about ovaries, size, location, location with each other, uh, relationship with each other, and then how they, um, you know, if they are not normal, then other functions they can be disturbed. Okay, then, mm -hmm. you know, fine function location, anterior relations, posterior relations, very important. Then you should know about the course of ureter. Because in most of the gynecological surgeries, even in the open surgeries, uh, bladder is the most commonly damaged organ. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then, please, especially if you, you, as you know, the incidence of endometriosis is very high. 
one in three patients mm -hmm. can have these symptoms. Okay. So we should be very okay. careful. Otherwise, we can damage the ureter at certain places. So you can't uh, pinpoint the injury unless you know about the location, and you cannot be very safe surgeon unless you know about your operative team. Then blood vessels, they are very important because uh, we need to avoid any trauma to them. And uh, if it occurs during laparoscopic or open surgeries, then even we can lose our patient. So we will have a need to take help of this vascular surgeon. Similarly, mm -hmm. if I talk about laparoscopic surgeries, you should know about the uh, anatomy of the anterior abdominal wall, at which point you are going to enter this abdomen when you are doing this laparoscopic surgery which area, which blood vessels can be damaged and what structures are lying over there, what different approaches we can adopt. So unless you have a good idea about anatomy, you can do many of these things. That's why these are very mm -hmm. important. You know about the external genitalia, so that you uh, to know about, to differ, differ, uh, differentiate between normal and abnormal genitalia, uh, you mm -hmm. will have to know about first about the normal genitalia. And then you can plan other surgeries and other structures. Then you should know that what will be the you should know about the, the gross anatomy of the lower limbs also. So all of these factors yeah. are very important. So we'll start with the brain and the supply of the brain. So the arterial circulation to the brain mainly comprises of anterior cerebral circulation and posterior cerebral circulation. The anterior and posterior cerebral circulations, they form a part of an anastomotic tree, which is called the circonocleus, And they are interconnected via anterior and posterior communicating arteries, which are present by the brain. Circonocleus is located at the base of the brain and helps in providing backup circulation to the brain in case of the occlusion of one of the vessels. However, its exact, exact structure is highly variable amongst individuals and often many people they have inadequate arteries. The arteries may not be, these arteries may not be able to compensate in cases of occlusion of a larger vessel, of a large vessel, because you know this is just, these are just alternative blood vessels, okay? but these are very important mm -hmm. to have some idea. If your patient has a Berry's aneurysm, any structures somewhere, mm -hmm. then you should know where exactly it has taken place. Okay, so this is the circle of illness. Circle of illness. Okay. So you will get various blood vessels, they will participate in it. Right from, you know, they can be branches. Uh, basically, th these are the anastomosis between the carotid branches of the carotid artery and branches of the vertebral arteries. They will not ask mm -hmm. you about the detail, um, but, but you should know that. That, that's what it looks like. It has got many branches. There are communicating branches. There are lateral branches, but they will not ask you about them. Important for you to okay. know that this is something called circle of villains, and it lies on the base of the brain. Mm -hmm. okay. Base of the brain. Okay. That is the big brain. Okay. So if we talk about that is the general structure. Now if we talk about you know the other features in the circle. So. I can show you here. Just a second, please. So, here are the anterior main arteries. Carotid coming from mm -hmm. the cerebral artery, anterior mm -hmm. coronal artery, these are branches of the internal carotid artery. So, at mm -hmm. the upper level of the sternocleidomastoid, this common carotid artery, which is coming from the on the right side, it is coming directly from the heart, and on the left side, it is coming from the subclavian artery. Okay, so these mm. are the this is the circumference. It is carrying getting branches from the internal carotid artery, and which will divide into ophthalmic artery. Uh, mm -hmm. It is given before it enters the circle of the anterior choroidal artery, going to the cerebral hemispheres, then anterior cerebral artery. Cerebral artery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, between two anterior cerebral arteries, there are communicating. There is a communicating artery which has got several small branches, and this one is a middle cerebral artery. So the same structure will you will see in the fetus also. And you know the importance of middle cerebral artery Doppler is that in, if we are suspecting anemia, then we will have to do Doppler of this artery. 
so then mm -hmm. you will see this superior communicating artery which is again a branch of the internal iliac artery so this one this all is coming from the internal carotid artery mm -hmm. so then this was the uh, you have seen here the anterior cerebral artery you can see where is the location okay uh, behind okay. the eyes above the eyes then mm -hmm. middle cerebral artery is on the temples up, um, mm -hmm. slightly anterior to the temples then we have got posterior cerebral artery so then go to this artery this is the basilar artery main artery which is lying on the brain stem it has got to give since it is lying on the mid brain so it will give arteries to the pons which are lying on the both sides okay then mm -hmm. you will see this is the region of the cerebellum so anterior inferior cerebral cerebellar artery vertebral arteries mm -hmm. which are entering the skull through the vertebral foramen, uh, foramen in the posterior part then anterior mm -hmm. species taking some twigs not main arteries just twigs from the anterior spinal artery which runs on the anterior surface of the spinal cord it will enter mm -hmm. the brain through the spinal foramen and then it will break into branch into two small arteries and then we have posterior inferior cerebellar artery they will not ask you about mm -hmm. the veins but at least you that this is the anastomosis between the internal carotid and the basilar artery and some branches are taken from the vertebral artery so that's all mm -hmm. so now the anatomy of the thorax it is also very important because the, uh, we will start with diaphragm diaphragm is a large muscle that forms a partition between the cavities of the thorax and the abdomen so basically it separates them okay so this one and it plays a crucial role in the circulation in the respiration why because 75 percent of the, the contraction is generated through the, this one this will constrict uh, this will contract and we will take the air in so the diaphragm it has got more or less circular origin or fan shaped origin from all parts of the thoracic outlet the mm -hmm. origin of the um, it can be divided into sternal part, costal part, and vertebral parts. So the first mm -hmm. part is the sternal part. It consists of two mm -hmm. slips, right? Usually they will not go into details. They will just they just want you to know that this is them. What are the origins? Which part? Which is the main part? And coming from where? And what is the role it is playing? So it arises mm -hmm. from the back of the fight process. What is the fight? The lower part of the sternum, the chest bone. Then we have a coastal, coastal part. This consists of two broad slips, one each from the inner surface of the, each of the lower six ribs from 7th to 12th. Mm -hmm. Along with, it will take some fibers from the, from the coastal, coastal cartilage. Part. So these slips interdigitate with those of an anterior muscle wall, which is that transversus abdominis. So they are um, woven across their origin. Then mm -hmm. we have got a lumbar part. Lumbar part consists of two crura, which is the right and the left. Each of the crura arises from the anterolateral aspect of the bodies of lumbar vertebrae and the lateral and the medial arcuate ligaments. The right class is larger than the la left one. It arises from the bodies of the vertebrae L1, L2, L3 and from the intervening intervertebral disc. On the mm -hmm. other hand, the left arises from the vertebrae L1 and L2. So you should know about their origin. The medial margins of the two crura are joined to each other at the level of the lower border of the vertebra T12 to form the median arcuate ligament. The descending aorta mm -hmm. passes from thorax to abdomen under cover of this ligament. The lateral arcuate ligament represents a thickened gland of acacia over the quadratus lumborum, which is a muscle in the posterior wall of the abdomen. It is attached laterally to the 12th rib, above its middle, and medially to the transverse process of the first lumbar vertebra. The medial arcuate ligament, this is a thickened band of fascia covering the swass major. It is attached laterally to the transverse process of the first lumbar vertebra. Medially, it becomes continuous with the lateral margin of the corresponding cross. From its extensive region, described like this one, we have that it has got four parts. The muscular fibers of the diaphragm, they run upward and converge to be inserted on the margins of a large, flat, central tendon, which is located 
to the pericardium and heart so the central tendon is usually made up of three leaf like parts or polia which are fused together the apex of the anterior or triangular leaf is apex which is apex is directed towards the z5 process and its base goes posteriorly where it becomes continuous with two tongue shaped posterior leaves the apex of the uh, so so what, what happens here is that um, they will receive anterior you know the apex of the anterior leaf receives the external fibers while the sides of this leaf receive the anterior costal fibers the posterior costal fibers they reach the lateral sides of the posterior polia while the fibers of the pleura and those arising from the arcuate ligaments such as the apices and medial margins of the posterior polia the upper convex part of the diaphragm is called its dome and it bulges consider ab the bony thorax thorax then the apertures are very important usually in the mcqs in the SPS, they will ask you that which structure passes through which aperture. So many structures passing from thorax to abdomen or vice versa, they pass through apertures in or around the diaphragm. So there are three large mm -hmm. apertures, one each of the aorta and the esophagus and the inferior vena cava and several smaller ones. So three apertures. The first one is aortic aperture. It lies behind the median arcuate ligament and in front of the disc between vertebra 12 and L1. The aorta therefore passes behind the diaphragm rather than through it. So it is passing behind. Otherwise, also as you know, the aorta it lies over the posterior abdominal wall. It is not lying anteriorly. So during inspiration, the pull of fibers of the muscles on the median arcuate ligament ensures that aorta is not compressed. The aortic aperture also transmits the thoracic duct, which lies to the right side of the aorta, and sometimes it will contain azygous and hemiazygous veins, which will carry lymph from the lower part to the upper part. The aperture of the esophagus, which is elliptical in shape, it is situated at the level of the 10th thoracic vertebra, usually an inch to the left of the midline. It is formed by splitting of the fibers of the right crust a little below their attachment to the central tendon. Since the esophagus is surrounded by muscles, it is compressed during expiration. This prevents regurgitation of the contents of the stomach. Besides the esophagus, the, uh, the aperture also transmits the phrenoesophageal ligament, the vagal trunks, the right and the left. Just remember, esophagus and the vagal trunks, they will go through this aperture. So the left gastric nerve is placed anteriorly and the right one posteriorly. They will not ask, they will basically ask about the main structure passing through each aperture. The aperture is called the inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, it will enter there. So the inferior vena cava, it will Enter it enters the thorax through the opening opposite the T8 vertebra just to the right of the midline. So now we are talking about their anatomy, so we should know a little bit about their embryology also that from where it develops. So, as you know, the myotomes are formed in the developing embryo in the fourth peak of the system. So the diaphragm is partly derived from the cervical myotomes and the myotomes and the mesoderm. So it is made up of structures uh, arising from the septum transversum, neuroperitoneal membranes, the dorsal mesentery, and body wall. So the septum transversum forms the central tendon. Its nerve supply is important. It, it receives a double nerve supply. The motor nerve supply arises from the right and left phrenic nerves. And the secondary nerve, sensory nerve supply to the peripheral part of the muscle is from the lower six, lower six intercostal nerves. That is from where it is, its muscles are taking origin, and so it is taking its nerve supply also from those areas. And so the diaphragm is spined by the right and left phrenic arteries, the intercostal arteries, and the musculophrenic branches of the internal thoracic arteries. Venous drainage from the diaphragm, it occurs through the inferior vena cava and azygous veins on the right and the adrenal and renal and hemizygous veins on the left side. Then what have pleura? 
the pura comprises of two layers the parietal and the visceral the parietal layer is in contact with the chest wall while the visceral layer is in close contact with the lungs apart from lining the surfaces of the lungs the visceral pleura dips into the fissures of the lungs and lines the contiguous contiguous sides of the lobes the parietal and visceral layers of the pleura they are in contact with each other being separated only by a potential space which is called the pleural cavity so the parietal pleura it can be divided into the following parts costovertebral pleura this lines the inner aspect of the ribs and the intercostal spaces part of the inner surfaces of the sternum and the sides of the thoracic cavity then there can be then the diaphragmatic pleura this lines the upper surface of the diaphragm however not all parts of the diaphragm are covered by pleura because diaphragm is a large muscle the mediastinal pleura it is in the portion it is the portion of the parietal pleural pleural membrane that lines the mediastinum it is bounded by and is continuous with the anterior and posterior margins of the costovertebral pleura the cervical pleura spirally and the diaphragmatic pleura inferiorly at the root of the lungs on both sides the mediastinum parietal pleura it passes laterally along the structures of the root to merge with the visceral pleura this region is the isthmus so despite the various divisions pleura forms one continuous layer and the and the visceral pleura is relatively insensitive to pain however the parietal pleura is highly sensitive to pain the diaphragmatic pleura is supplied by the phrenic nerve over the domes and the intercostal nerves over the periphery the blood supply of visceral pleura is derived from the bronchial and pulmonary arteries now so the thorax thorax are very important phrenic nerve these are among the most important nerves in the body as they are the only motor supply to diaphragm so if diaphragm <laughs> has no nerve supply then what will be the result the result will be that we won't be able to breathe so if we can't breathe then we will become hypoxemic and you know without oxygen we can't survive um <laughs> of the blood is to carry oxygen to each tissue of the body so in, if, if we have no respiration no oxygen and we will die due to ischemia each nerve right or left arises from the anterior cavity rami of spinal nerves c3 4 and c5 contribution from the c4 being the great the nerve descends vertically through the lower part of the neck and then through the thorax to reach the diaphragm some terminal branches they enter the abdomen in the neck the phrenic nerve descends vertically across the scalenus anterior muscle crossing the median or the lower border of the muscle it crosses in front of the first part of the subclavian artery on the right side however the nerve is usually separated from the artery by a part of the scalenus anterior throughout its course in the neck the nerve, the nerve lies deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscle on entering the thorax the nerve passes medially across uh, crossing in front of the internal thoracic artery and comes into relationship with structures in the mediastinum subsequent relations are different from the right and the left sides because different structures lie there the left phrenic nerve passes inferiorly down the neck to the lateral border of the scalenus anterior then it passes medially across the border of scalenus anterior parallel to the internal jugular vein which lies in po medially at this point it is deep to three vertebral fascia the transverse cervical artery and the suprascapular artery it descends between the left subclavian and the left common carotid arteries and crosses the left surface of the arch of aorta the pleura and the pericardium and a small part of the peritoneum so relations of uh, phrenic nerve they are as follows just remember the main points because you know as you can see that um, you know the on the right above the arch of the aorta so above the arch of aorta the nerve lies in the interval between the left common carotid and the left subclavian arteries it at first lies posterior and lateral to the vagus nerve but crosses the lateral Like superficially and comes to lie in front and median to it. The nerve that crosses the aortic arch lying on its anterolateral side. However, the nerve crosses superficially to the left, the superior intercostal vein. 
again below the arch of the aorta the phenic nerve passes in front of the structures comprising the root of the left lung and then descends across the heart the left ventricle lying between the parietal pericardium and the mediastinal pleura on the right side there are some differences after crossing the internal thoracic artery the nerve reaches the right vacuocephalic vein turns downwards lateral to this vein and it at its lower end the nerve passes on to the lateral side of the superior vena cava leaving the vena cava the nerve descends over the right side of the heart the right atrium lying between the parietal pericardium and the mediastinal pleura just above the diaphragm the nerve flies lateral to the inferior vena cava second important nerve is vagus nerve as you know this is the 10th cranial nerve arises from the vein from medulla oblongata it descends vertically in the neck in close relationship to the internal or common carotid artery and the internal jugular vein in the lower part of the neck the nerve crosses anterior to the first part of the subclavian artery and enters the thorax so course and relations of the vagus nerve are very important in the uh, in the thorax the course of the right vagus is slightly different from that of the left one so it lies in the superior mediastinum the right vagus nerve lies on the right side of the trachea here it is close to medial first then to the right brachiocephalic vein and then to the superior vena cava the nerve passes deep to the esophagus vein to reach the posterior side of the root of the right lung regarding course of left vagus the left vagus nerve descends between the left common carotid and left subclavian arteries in the superior mediastinum it passes behind the left brachiocephalic vein and then crosses the left side of the arch of the aorta to reach the posterior aspect of the root of the left lung the nerve is related laterally to the left lung and pleura above the arch of the aorta the vagus is crossed by the left phenic nerve over the arch of the aorta it is crossed by the left superior intercostal vein having reached the now it will reach the root of the lung so each vagus nerve right or left it will divide into a number of branches and therefore ceases to exist as distinct trunk so recurrent laryngeal nerve is an important branch which is given by the vagus nerve in the thorax which provides motor supply to the most of the intrinsic muscles of the larynx this nerve also provides sensory supply to the mucous membrane of the lower half of the larynx so if someone is doing um, uh, surgery on thorax and this recurrent laryngeal nerve has been damaged then what will happen this patient will have will develop hoarseness of voice that's why it is very important then we should talk about the female breast the female breast or mammary gland this is situated within the subcutaneous tissues and extends from the second to the sixth rib in the mid clavicular line overlying the fascia over pectoralis major and serratus anterior beneath the breast tissue there is a condensation of superficial fascia which acts as a posterior capsule for the breast the gland is normally mobile over the fascia the parent chyma comprises of about 15 to 20 lobes each of which is drained by a lactiferous duct the various lactiferous ducts they open on the nipple and the breast stoma comprises of adipose and fibrous tissue the breast nipple is surrounded by an areola which is a, uh, an areola of the pigmented skin which darkens during pregnancy and then remains so the areola contains accessory membrane glands sweat glands and sebaceous glands these form montgomery tubercles during pregnancy and they lubricate the nipple during lactation the upper outer quadrant of the breast containing a large amount of granular tissue is the most common site of breast carcinoma this is a sva question which part of the brain is of the breast is most commonly involved during uh, cancers again we should look at its embryology so at the end of the first month of embryonic development the membrane gland begins to develop as two vertical ectodermal thickenings in form of solid bars into the underlying mesenchyma these thickenings extend from the axilla to the inguinal region the ventral part of each forms a nipple the membrane gland that develop from the nipple during fetal life at the time of puberty in the females the breast grows and 
there occurs the development of ducts and globules. However, through secretion and alveoli, they do not develop until pregnancy. So if we talk about the blood supply, it's very important because uh, infections and cancers, they will spread through these blood vessels. So the arterial supply of the press comes from axillary artery, so via the branches is superior thoracic artery, pectoral branches of the pectoral artery, and the lateral thoracic artery, internal thoracic artery, mm -hmm. and interventional arteries. So the, that's how the breast receives its blood supply. Lateral thoracic artery supplies lateral part of the breast. Lateral thoracic artery supplies lateral part of the breast, and the a profound part is also supplied by intercostal arteries and their branches. So, regarding venous drainage, the corresponding veins, that is, axillary vein, internal thoracic vein, and the intercostal veins, they accompany the arteries supplying the breast. The veins draining the breast tissue from an anastomotic circle around the base of the nipple called the Haller, Haller circus venous, venosus. From this large branches, they transmit blood from the medial part of the breast into internal thoracic veins and from the lateral part of the breast into the lateral thoracic vein and intercostal veins. These eventually drain into the superior vena cava. Connections between the intercostal veins and the vertebral plexus, they result in metastatic deposits to bones and nervous system is in cases of breast cancer. If we talk about lymphatic drainage of the breast, then we should know that the lymph vessels of the breast, they are situated in two layers, superficial and deep layers, making subareolar plexus, which, is, which are again superficial and deep, that are interconnected. Superficial lymph vessels transmit the lymph fluid into the axillary lymph nodes. The majority of lymph drains into the subareolar plexus and then into the pectoral group of axillary lymph nodes. 75% of lymph drains to this group of lymph nodes. Lymph from the medial aspect of the breast is most likely to drain through the intercostal spaces into the parasternal group of the lymph nodes. While that from the lateral breast is likely to drain into the axillary and infraclavicular nodes. Free communication exists between nodes below and above the clavicle and between the axillary and cervical group of lymph nodes. Internal memory nodes communicate with the lymphatics across the midline. Therefore, cancer from one side can spread to the opposite side. The axillary nodes, they can be arbitrarily divided into five groups. The lateral nodes, these lie behind axillary veins and drain the upper lymph. Second group is the pectoral nodes. Uh, these lie at the inferior border of the pectoral is minor and they drain most of the brain tissue. So a quad then a quadrate group of nodes to which drainage occurs, they can be suprarectal, a quadrant, anterior, posterior axillary group of lymph nodes, and supraclavicular group of lymph nodes. Then in the supramedial quadrant, the internal memory group supraclavicular nodes, then there is inframedial quadrant, so it will drain to internal memory group, and then there is a supradiaphragmatic, there are end to the supradiaphragmatic nodes. This is about the inframedial part. Then we have infralateral quadrant, which will go to the posterior intercostal nodes and the subdiaphragmatic group. Then the posterior or subscapular nodes. These are present in the posterior axillary cord and primarily drain the posterior shoulder. The central nodes, these are present near the base of the axilla and they receive lymph from the previously mentioned groups, three groups. The central nodes belonging to the axillary group of the lymph nodes, they form the group which is most likely to be palpable against the lateral thoracic wall. Fifth group is called the apical nodes these lie medial to the axillary vein and superior to the pectoralis minor. The apical nodes receive the limb from all the other groups and sometimes directly from the breasts. They eventually drain into the deep cervical group of lymph nodes. Therefore, at the time of breast examination, it is important to carefully examine the axilla to examine the supra and subclavicular lymph nodes. The 
particular group, however, is not part of the auxiliary group of the lymph nodes, but that's where they all will gain in the end. Nowadays, a simple nomenclature of classification of auxiliary nodes is adopted based on the relation of the nodes to the pectoral spinal muscles. So those lying below the muscles are the low nodes and those lying behind the muscles, they are the middle groups, level two, and the nodes between the upper border of the pectoral is minor and the lower border of the cervical, they are the upper or the apical group, we call them level three. So, but for the sake of exam, I would suggest you should remember these five groups because still in the questions, they are asking about those groups. Next supply of the breast is there and derived from the branches of the fourth to sixth intercostal nerves. They carry the sensory and sympathetic fib nerve fib front fibers. The supply to the nipple is from T4. This forms an extensive plexus of nerves within the nipple, its sensory fibers terminating close to the epithelium in form of free endings such as Meissner's capsules and Merkel's disc endings. These are the names of specialized nerve endings. Anatomy of the abdominal wall is very important. And uh, this is the part of the abdominal wall extending all the way from the midline to the lateral edge of the quadratus lumborum is referred to as the anterior abdominal wall. Therefore, the anterior abdominal wall is not only confined to the anterior aspect of the abdomen, but also includes the lateral sides. Schematic transverse section through the abdomen, we will talk about it in a while. So muscles, what are the important muscles of the anterior abdominal wall? The musculature of the abdominal wall is composed of two muscle groups. One group comprising of the back muscles consists of uh, three muscles, the external oblique, the internal oblique, and the transversus abdominis. The second group is composed of two muscles that run vertically and comprise of muscles rectus abdominis and pyramidalis because they lie straight like ribbons. External oblique muscle. This is the largest and the most superficial of the flat muscles of the anterolateral abdominal wall. So region and insertion, they are very important because uh, they make certain landmarks. The fibers of the external oblique muscles, they run forward and downward. It arises from the external surface of the lower eight ribs, external surfaces, okay, from rib fifth to twelve. Regarding insertion, the external oblique muscle courses diagonally anteriorly and inferiorly to get inserted upon the pubic tubercle, anterior half of the eyelid crest, and linea alba. Second important muscle is internal oblique. So this muscle is intermediate amongst the three muscles of the anterior abdominal wall. The fibers of the internal oblique muscles, they run forward and upwards. So regarding their origin, they arise from the thoracolumbar fascia, anterior two-third of the eyelid crest, and the connective tissue deep to the lateral third of the inguinal ligament. This muscle is, it courses at a right angle to the fibers of the external weak muscle and gets inserted on the inferior borders of 10th to 12th rib, linea alba, and 15 pubis by the conjoint tendon. This is a sharp area on the pubis. The aponeurosis of the internal oblique splits at the lateral edge of the rectus muscle into an anterior and posterior lamina to envelop the rectus abdominis muscle. The anterior layer blends with the aponeurosis of the external oblique posterior to the rectus muscle. This aponeurosis blends with the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis to form a portion of the posterior rectus in most areas, the fibers of this muscle are perpendicular to the fibers of the external oblique, but in the lower abdomen, their fibers, they are somewhat more, more cordially and run in a direction similar to those of the external oblique. Third muscle in the anterior abdominal wall is rectus abdominis. This is the innermost of the flat muscles in the transversus abdominis, and its fibers, they run more or less transversely. It originates from the internal surfaces of 7th to 12th rib, costal cartilage, thoracolumbar fascia, eyelid crest, and connective tissue deep to the lateral third of the inguinal ligament. It courses transversely to the midline. The upper three fourths of the transverse aponeurosis lies behind the rectus muscle. The lower one fourth of the aponeurosis passes in front of the rectus muscle. The fibers of transversus abdominis 
gets inserted into the linear alba along with the aponeurosis of internal oblique and into the pubic crest and in pubis via the conjoint tendon. Between the muscle fibers of internal oblique and transversus abdominis, there is a neurovascular plane of the anterolateral abdominal wall which contains the nerves and arteries supplying the anterolateral abdominal wall. Rectus abdominis muscle, it belongs to the group of muscles which run, which runs vertically. It is the principal muscle of the vertical group. There are three tendinous insertions within each rectus abdominis muscle. These fibrous interruptions within the muscles help in firmly attaching it to the rectus sheath. This produces a six-pack appearance in athlete, athletic individuals. These fibrous interruptions are usually confined to the region above the umbilicus, but sometimes they can also be found below the umbilicus. When found below the umbilicus, the rectus sheath is attached firmly to the rectus muscle at the region of description. This may cause difficulty at the time of muscle separation during fenestral incision. So fenestral incision, as you know, is a transverse incision. We give like two centimeter above the pubis synthesis. This muscle originates from the pubis synthesis and the pubic crest. And after taking it to region, the rectus muscle fibers, they run vertically to get inserted into the zygoid process and the fifth, sixth, and seventh costal cartilage. The rectus muscle is surrounded by a sheath comprising of the aponeurosis of the oblique muscles and the transversus abdominis. Another important muscle of the anterior abdominal wall is pyramidalis. This muscle is absent in approximately 20% of the population and lies anterior to the inferior part of the rectus abdominis. This muscle marks the midline and assists in the identification of the medial border of the rectus muscle. Its origin is as a small vestigial triangular shaped muscle. It uh, takes its origin from the pubis and pubic symphysis and inserts into the anterior surface of the pubis and the anterior pubic ligament. It ends in the linear alba, which is specially thickened for a variable distance superior to the pubis symphysis. The pointed insertion of the pyramidalis muscle into the linear alba, it can be used for locating the midline. Blood supply of the anterior abdominal wall is very important because if we don't know about it, we can damage several blood vessels and the patient can have severe bleeding. Primary blood supply to the abdominal wall is from the superficial and deep blood vessels. The main blood vessels supplying the anterolateral abdominal wall, these are as follows. Superior epigastric vessels and the branches of the musculophrenic artery. Then inferior epigastric and deep circumflex iliac arteries. Superficial circumflex iliac and superficial epigastric arteries. Posterior intercostal vessels of the, ele of the 11th intercostal space and and the anterior branches of the subcostal vessels. The, so the blood supply, the, the superficial blood vessels, they originate from the femoral artery and include the superficial epigastric, superficial circumflex, and the superficial external pudendal arteries. The deep vessels, on the other hand, originate from the external iliac and the internal thoracic artery. These include the inferior epigastric artery, the deep circumflex artery, and the superior epigastric artery, which is the terminal branch of the internal thoracic artery. The internal thoracic artery also gives rise to the musculophrenic artery, which anastomosis with the deep circumflex artery. Anastomosis between the various vessels of the abdominal wall helps in ensuring an excellent blood supply to all parts of the abdominal wall. The individual blood vessels would not, can be described now because these are important. Even for part two, uh, you need to remember them because they will ask you about these, these blood vessels and the nerves. Mm -hmm. The superior epigastric okay. vessel is the direct continuation of the internal thoracic artery. It enters the rectus sheath superiorly through its posterior layer and supplies the superior part of the rectus abdominis and anastomosis mm -hmm. with the inferior epigastric artery in the umbilical region. Inferior epigastric artery, it arises from the external iliac artery. So, you know, the origins are different. The superior one is coming from internal thoracic and the inferior one is coming from the external iliac artery, just superior to the inguinal ligaments. It runs mm -hmm. superiorly in the 
salis fascia to enter the rectus sheath below the arcuate line. It enters the lower part of the rectus abdominis and anastomosis with the superior epigastric artery. Superficial circumflex artery, it is the branch of the femoral artery which runs in the subcutaneous tissue towards the umbilicus. It supplies the superficial abdominal wall of the inguinal region and the adjacent anterior thigh region. Superficial epigastric artery, it begins as a single artery that branches extensively and runs in the subcutaneous tissues towards the umbilicus. It supplies superficial abdominal wall of pubic and inferior umbilical regions. Musculoskeletal artery originates from the internal thoracic vessel and descends along the costal margin. It supplies the superficial and deep abdominal walls of the epigastric and upper umbilical regions. The 10th and 11th posterior intercostal, intercostal arteries and subcostal arteries, they originate from the aorta. They continue, continue beyond the ribs to descend into the anterior abdominal wall between internal oblique and transversus abdominal muscles. They supply superficial and deep abdominal wall of lateral lumbar or flank region. The age of anterior wall is very important because the cancer cells and infections, they can ascend through the lymphatics. And if there is blockage, to, blockage in the lymphatic vessels, then your patient can have collection of fluid into the lower part of, of the abdomen. Lymphatics in the region above the umbilicus, they drain into the axillary lymph nodes. And lymphatics in the region below the umbilicus, they drain into the superficial inguinal lymph nodes. Superficial inguinal lymph nodes, they also receive lymph drainage from the lower abdominal wall, buttocks, scrotum, penis, labia majors, and the lower part of the vagina and the inner canal. The efferent lymphatic vessels from the superficial inguinal group of lymph nodes primarily drain into the external iliac nodes and ultimately the lumbar or aortic nodes, eventually reaching the cisternal chyle and the thoracic duct. On the other hand, the deep inguinal lymph nodes, they receive most of the drainage from the lower limbs. Efferent lymphatic vessels from the deep inguinal group of lymph nodes similar to the superficial group, they drain into the external iliac, common iliac, and lumbar group of lymph nodes, ultimately reaching the cisterna chyle and the thoracic ducts. Nerve supply of anterior abdominal wall, uh, in, it includes the thoracoabdominal nerves, subcostal nerve, and the ilioinguinal nerve, the iliohypogastric, and the lateral cutaneous branches of the thoracic spinal nerves. So, if we talk about thoracoabdominal nerve, you should know about the root values and how the patient will present if they have been damaged. These are the distal abdominal part of the anterior MI of the inferior five thoracic nerves, which are T7 to T11, and the thoracoabdominal nerves, they travel corded between the transversus abdominis and the internal oblique muscles. These are these nerves innervate the flat muscles of the abdominal wall and the rectus muscles. So, then iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerves. Both of these nerves are the terminal branches of the anterior ramus of the spinal nerve L1, with the iliohypogastric nerve being the superior terminal branch and the ilioinguinal nerve being the inferior one. Iliohypogastric nerve supplies the skin overlying the iliac crest upper inguinal and hypogastric regions, internal oblique and transversus abdominis muscles. Ilioinguinal nerves, on the other hand, it supplies the skin of the lower inguinal region, mons pubis, anterior scrotum or labia majors, and the adjacent medial thighs, as well as inferior most regions of the internal oblique and transversus abdominis. Damage to these nerves may result in sensory changes in the mons pubis and in the labia majora. Lateral cutaneous branches, they arise from the muscle musculature of the anterolateral abdominal wall and they, supply, they emerge from the musculature of the anterolateral abdominal wall and originate from the anterior MI of spinal nerves T7 to T9. It then enters the subcutaneous tissue along the anterior axillary line in the form of anterior and posterior divisions. 
the costal nerve, it originates from the anterior ramus of spinal nerve T12. It passes between the second and third layers of abdominal muscles and the transverse sinus canal. Anterior abdominal cutaneous branches of the thoraco abdominal nerves. These supply the following areas. Skin superior to the umbilicus. This is supplied by T7 to T9. Skin around the umbilicus. This is supplied by the T10. Skin below the umbilicus, this is supplied by T11 and the cutaneous branches of the subcostal, ileohypogastric and ileoinguinal nerves. Rectus sheet. This is a very important structure in the anterior abdominal wall. It is formed by the conjoint aponeurosis of the flat abdominal muscles. It is formed by the decussation and interweaving of the aponeurosis of these muscles. The aponeurosis of external oblique muscle contributes to the formation of the anterior wall of the sheath throughout its length. The concentric line, the arcuate line, it lies midway between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis and demarcates the transition between the aponeurotic posterior wall of the sheath covering the superior three pores of the rectus and the transverse sinus fascia covering the inferior quarter. Throughout the length of the sheath, the fibers of the anterior and posterior layer of the sheath, they interlace into the anterior median line to form the complex linea L. To form the X linea eta. Just a second. Uh, you know, this conference will now be recorded. Okay. So the ventral rami of lower seven thoracic nerves and the anastomosis between the superior and inferior epigastric vessels occur within the rectus sheath. When the pyramidalis muscle is present, it lies within the sheath anterior to the rectus abdominis. So you should know about the composition of rectus sheath in the different parts. They will not give you pictures. They will just give statements and then you will have to find the correct statement. Okay. So above the arcuate line, the superior two-thirds of the internal oblique aponeurosis splits into two layers at the lateral border of the rectus abdominis with one lamina passing anterior to the muscles and the other posterior to The anterior lamina joins the aponeurosis of external oblique muscles to form the anterior layer of the rectus sheath. The posterior lamina of internal oblique joins the aponeurosis of transversus abdominis to form the posterior layer of the rectus sheath. Below the arcuate line, the aponeurosis of the three flat muscles passes anterior to the rectus abdominis to form the anterior layer of the rectus sheath, leaving only the relatively thin transversal fascia to cover the rectus abdominis muscle posteriorly. Superior to costal margin, the posterior layer of the rectus sheath is also deficient superior to costal margin because the transversus abdominis is continued superiorly as the transversus thoracis, which lies internal to the costal cartilages and the internal oblique attaches to the costal margins. Hence, superior to the costal margins, the rectus abdominis muscles, it lies directly on the thoracic bone. So what is the importance for the surgeon? Uh, there are several specialized aspects of the rectus sheath that are important to the surgeons, the, especially the gyneco in the gynecology. In forming the rectus sheath, the conjoined aponeurosis of the individual flank muscles, they can be separated lateral to the rectus sheath, um, rectus muscles, but as they reach the midline, they fuse and lose their separate directions. As a result of this midline fusion, these layers are usually incised together in the midline while giving a transverse spatial incision. Now, if we talk about the posterior abdominal wall, the posterior abdominal wall is made up of the following structures, the lumbar vertebrae in the middle plane and the source muscle lying along each side of the vertebral bodies. These, um, these are important landmarks. Okay? Then the quadratus lumborum muscle, which are present more laterally. So if we talk about the abdominal cavity, since it is a cavity, so it will contain many contents. So what are they? Abdominal aorta, the thoracic aorta, it pierces the diaphragm at T12 to become the abdominal aorta. It ends by dividing into two common iliac arteries at the level of L4. Note that the bifurcation of the inferior vena cava, it occurs at the level of L5. 
and therefore lies below the level of bifurcation of the aorta. The ventral branches of the aorta include the celiac artery and the superior and inferior mesenteric arteries. Several anastomoses occur between the branches of these ventral vessels, and these are as follows. The anastomosis between the branches of the left gastric artery with the esophageal branches directly arising from the aorta around the lower esophagus. Anastomosis between left gastric artery with the right gastric artery, which, are the, which is the anastomosis between with the branches of hepatic artery. Then there are branches of the abdominal aorta. Uh, so if we talk about them, you know, these are very important landmarks because they can answer several questions from here. So inferior phrenic artery, this is also a branch of the abdominal aorta. And uh, it is um, it takes origin at level T12. And uh, this is also paired. And uh, it is a posterior branch. And it originates just below the diaphragm and supplying it from below. Then celiac axis, it arises at the level of L1. You know, these levels are important for the test. And they are not paired because we have just one celiac axis. So, and it lies anteriorly and it gives different other branches. You should at least know about their name, left gastric artery, saphenic artery, and uh, you know, they will also anastomose with several other arteries, like the splenic artery, it will have anastomosis with short gastric arteries, splenic arteries, and the left gastroepipike artery. Third branch of the celiac branch is common hepatic artery. It will give a cystic branch to the gallbladder, right gastric artery, gastrourinary artery, which will further divide into the right um, gastroepipike and superior pancreatic urinal artery and then it will have a right hepatic artery and left hepatic artery so all of these are very important branches of celiac axis or celiac trunk which is a branch of the dominant aorta so celiac axis is the artery of the fore gut and arises from the aorta between the right and the left pleura of the diaphragm it is one centimeter long and is surrounded by the celiac plexus of the nerves Superior mesenteric artery, it arises at the lower border of the L1. Silic is coming at the upper border of L1 and the superior mesenteric is arising at the lower level of the L1. It doesn't have branches, lies anteriorly and its branches are jejunal and island arteries. Inferior pancreatic duodenal artery, middle colic artery, right colic artery and ileocolic artery which, is, um, which gives further branches to like anterior cecum and posterior cecum and appendicular artery. So it will supply the, the cecum and appendix. Then ileal branches and colic branches. So this is a large anterior branch arising just below celiac trunk. It supplies the gastrointestinal tract from the middle of the second part of the duodenum as far as the distal one third of the transverse colon. In other words, this artery supplies the parts of the gut which are derived from the mid guts. So actually you have one artery for each part of the gut from the for the first part second part and the third part so then you know we have middle suprarenal arteries arising at the level of l1 and they are paired and they lie posteriorly and they supply both adrenal glands then we have renal arteries so it lies between l1 and l2 these are paired and they also lie on the posterior abdominal wall. These are large arteries, each arising from the side of aorta and divides into several branches, which supply the corresponding segment of each kidney. So they are very important. And, uh, you know, then we get gonadal branches. They arise at the level of L2 and they are paired. They lie anteriorly and ovarian artery in women and the test testicular artery in men. These are the names and they are important because if, uh, you know, and because lymphatic drainage is important and if the lymph nodes are involved then we will know, know exactly that which organ has been involved and as you can see the you know, the gland the gonads they will lie in the pelvis but they develop in the abdomen and they take their blood supply from those areas so they don't have any separate gonadal arteries then lumbar arteries l1 to l4 they are also paired they lie posteriorly and there are four lumbar arteries on each side of the abdominal wall and they supply the abdominal wall and the spinal cord. Inferior mesenteric artery, it arises at L3. It's very important to remember these levels. And uh, this is not a paired artery. It lies anteriorly and it gives uh, further branches like left colic artery, sigmoid arteries, and superior rectal arteries. 
The superior rectal artery is the continuation of the inferior mesenteric artery and descends in the base of the pelvic mesocolon. It supplies parts of the gut which are derived from the hind gut. Then median sacral arises at the level of L4. This is a single branch, runs posteriorly and it arises from the middle of the iota at its lowest part. Common iliac artery, very important for you. It takes its origin at L4. So um, the, these are paired, right and left common. So it's a paired artery and flies posteriorly and then it will divide into each. Uh, this, common, uh, this common iliac artery will divide into external iliac and internal iliac. So this is the end of the abdominal aorta which bifurcates to supply blood to the lower limbs and the pelvis. Important to remember these landmarks, L4. There are certain anastomosis between anterior and posterior superior pancreatic duodenal arteries, like uh, with the branches of the celiac trunk, with the inferior pancreatic duodenal artery, like, uh, like which is a branch of the superior mesenteric branch around the head of the pancreas and the second part of the duodenum. Then the marginal artery anastomosis with the middle colic and the left colic. Then there are anastomosis between the superior rectal artery, uh, of, which is a branch of the inferior mesenteric artery, and with the middle rectal artery, which is a branch of the internal iliac artery, and or the inferior rectal, which is branch of the internal pudendal artery, which arises from the internal iliac. So can you tell me what type of anastomosis we are talking about? Okay, this is your homework. You will tell me what type of anastomosis are these. Okay. Then there are certain peritoneal oh, reflections hello? which are important. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. You know what type of we are talking yeah, about uh... Yeah. Hello? What do we call this type of circulation? There are certain anastomosis near the lower edge of the esophagus. Then near yeah. this we are discussing the about them. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, I, I know you know, but okay, recall them and then tell me. Okay, there are certain points, these anastomoses are very important, and you know, uh -huh. there can be several problems. So, mm -hmm. and then in cases of liver disorders, we can find increased pressure, and then there can, there can be varices, right? And then there can mm -hmm. be, there is a specific name for this sort of circulation, which you will tell me later, okay? So, peritoneal refractions are very important. The abdominal cavity and most of the viscera within it, they are lined by a serous membrane, which is called peritoneum. Since the peritoneum is a coast sac that is invaginated by viscera, it has a parietal layer lining the abdominal wall and a visceral layer, which is closely applied to the viscera. The pericardium, pleura, and peritoneum, they have a similar arrangement, having parietal and visceral layers with a cavity between. Whenever you have layers so you will have a space between them which is called a cavity so the peritoneal cavity it contains a thin film of fluid which allows free movement of the viscera against the abdominal wall and against each other so there is a little amount of fluid otherwise due to friction these structures can be damaged so peritoneal um, the peritoneum is arranged in a certain way it is um, with a relation to the viscera and with relation to the abdominal wall some abdominal organs are in contact with the posterior abdominal wall and are only partly lined by peritoneum. Such viscera are, are described as being retroperitoneal and they have limited mobility, like the bare area of the liver, duodenum, ascending colon, descending colon, rectum, kidneys, and ureters, adrenal glands, midget blood vessels, such as abdominal aorta, inferior vena cava, and eyelid vessels. In contrast to such viscera, there are other organs which are suspended from the, from the abdominal wall by double-layered folds of peritoneum passing from the abdominal wall to the viscera, for example, small intestine. The fold of peritoneum by which the small intestine, which, which contains jejunum and ileum, is attached to the posterior abdominal wall is known as the mesentery. Some other similar folds are mesocolon, which is attached to the colon, and mesoovarium, which is attached to the ovaries, then uh, the names are regional. Blood vessels and nerves, they reach the concerned viscera through these folds. The peritoneal cavity is completely closed in the male. On the other hand, in the female, it communicates via the tubal ostium. 
source osteoperopian tubes some peritoneal reflections are known as ligaments or folds for instance gastrohepatic ligaments or recto uterine folds respectively a broad peritoneal sheet or peritoneal reflection is termed as omentum these include the lesser omentum and the greater omentum the abdominal cavity also comprises of a general peritoneal cavity or the greater sac and the omental bus, bus, uh, you know this bursa or the lesser sac which lies behind the stomach and its peritoneal attachments the lesser sac communicates with the greater sac by the so called epiploic foramen which can be found by running a finger along the gall bladder to the free edge of the lesser omentum so lesser omentum as we mentioned this is a broad peritoneal reflection which connects the stomach to the liver then we have a greater omentum the greater omentum is a double fold of peritoneum that connects the stomach to the posterior abdominal wall it hangs down from the stomach and merges with the mesentery attached to the anterior aspect of the transverse colon now it is fused behind with the sternal transverse colon and mesocolon and it is separate from them then we have a great sac greater sac which extends from the diaphragm to the pelvic floor it is the cavity in the abdomen that is inside the peritoneum but lies outside the lesser sac it is further divided into two compartments by the transverse mesocolon the supracolic compartment this lies above the transverse mesocolon and contains stomach liver and spleen the infracolic compartment this lies below the transverse mesocolon and contains the small intestine ascending and descending colon lesser sac is entirely related to lesser sac then what are the relations anteriorly the lesser omentum superiorly the posterior surface of the stomach centrally and the anterior two layers of the greater omentum inferiorly posteriorly the peritoneum that covers the diaphragm pancreas left kidney and suprarenal gland and duodenum and the posterior two layers of the greater omentum which fuse with transverse mesocolon Spherically, gastrocephalic part of the greater omentum on the left side, caudate lobe of liver on the right side, laterally limited on the left side by by lino-renal ligament on the right side, opens into the greater sac through the epiploic foramen. So this epiploic foramen usually they will ask you about the boundaries. This is also called foramen of Winslow. So this is the passage of or come of communication or foramen or an opening from the greater into the lesser sac it lies immediately posterior to the free right edge of the lesser omentum a finger in the opening and a thumb in front of the omentum would encircle the bile duct at the right side and they are often asked about the uh, boundary so bile duct then on the left side there is hepatic artery and the portal vein posterior and between them boundaries of the uh, and between them so the boundaries of the foramen we are describing them anterior margin anterior wall is made by the free border of the lesser omentum with a common bile duct hepatic artery portal vein between its two layers posteriorly the peritoneum covers the inferior vena cava superiorly peritoneum on the caudate lobe of the liver inferiorly the peritoneum covering the commencement of the duodenum and the hepatic artery with the latter passing forward below the foramen before ascending between the two layers of the lesser omentum so after discussing this much of the abdominal wall now we will go to the inguinal region inguinal canal is an important landmark in the adult it is approximately 1.5 cm long Uh, 1.5 inches or 4 cm long and runs downwards and medially towards the superficial inguinal vein starting from that deep inguinal vein so it runs from deep to superficial so the deep ring acts as the entrance point of the inguinal canal whereas the superficial inguinal ring acts as the exit point The deep inguinal ring is situated in the transosinus fascia, midway between the anterior superior iliac spine and the symphysis pubis. Even this simple part is has been asked in the SPAs, and lies about 1.2 centimeter above the inguinal ligament and is lateral to the epigastric vessels. 
the inferior epigastric artery runs medial to the deep inguinal ring. Clinically, this has value in differentiating indirect, which is lateral to the artery, from direct, which will be medial to the artery in dynal hernias. The superficial inguinal ring is a triangular slit in the external of the caponeurosis just above the and lateral to the pubic tubercle. Inguinal canal acts as a pathway through which the structures can pass from the abdominal wall to the external genitalia. It also acts as the peritoneal potential area for development of inguinal hernias. So inguinal hernias are more common in male. So if we talk about the boundaries, it has got a superior wall or root. So which structures do form it? So medial thrust of aponeurosis of the external oblique, musculophrenic, um, musculoaponeurotic arches of the internal oblique and transversus of the abdominis and transversus fascia. Basically two tendons of two muscles, external oblique and internal oblique plus transversus abdominis. Anterior wall, aponeurosis of the external oblique in the middle third and the fleshy part of the internal oblique, which is the lateral third of the canal only. And then posterior wall is formed by, by the transverse cellus fascia and the middle third of the posterior wall is formed by the conjoint tendon, which means fused aponeurosis of the internal oblique and transverse abdominis. They like to also experience on conjoint tendon also. And inguinal fox, which is reflected part of the inguinal ligament. Lateral third of the posterior wall is formed by deep inguinal ring. Inferior wall or the floor, this is formed by the, so the floor is formed by the inguinal ligament and then lacunar ligament, which is the medial third, in, which is present in the medial third of the canal only. Iofibic tract, which is, which forms let, lateral third of the canal. So, contents of the inguinal canal are in the inguinal canal, they are different in the males and the females. In the male, they contain spermatic cord ileoinguinal nerve. This nerve only passes through the superficial inguinal run, uh, ring and it is not carried through the deep inguinal ring and therefore doesn't formally travel through the inguinal canal. But it, anyhow, it passes through the superficial ring. In the female, it will contain, you must have seen th that question in the SPs also. In the females, it contains round ligament in the female. The inguinal canal transmits the round ligament to the labium pages. This, this is an important um, ligament to hold the uterus in its position. Ileo inguinal nerve, it only passes through the superficial ring, just like in the male. So it is not carried through the deep ring. Inguinal ligament is very important. It is present at the upper end of the front of a thigh, that is at its junction with the anterior abdominal wall. Actually, this ligament is the thickened and folded over lower edge of the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle. It extends from the anterior superior ilex spine to the pubic tubercle in a curved line which holds posteriorly. Its medial attachment forms a narrow sling for support of the spermatic cord or round ligament of the uterus. The spermatic cord is present near the medial end of the inguinal ligament. It is seen to emerge through the superficial inguinal ring. So present a little below the medial end of the inguinal ligament is the saphenous opening. This is an oval aperture in the deep fascia of the thigh. The lateral and inferior margins of opening is sharp and is known as the falciform margin. Spermatic cord, this is formed when a testis passes through the inguinal canal descending into the scrotum. It has three coverings. It has an internal spermatic fascia, which is derived from the transversalis fascia. Then it has cremasteric fascia, which is derived from the internal oblique. Then it has an external spermatic fascia, which is derived from the external oblique. And you know, all these three muscles will be together. So it is wherever it is passed, from wherever it is passing, it is taking a layer with it. If we talk about the contents, it has boss deference or the ductus deference. Three nerves, genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve, it will supply the trimester muscle. If it is damaged, your patient will not exhibit hemostatic reflex. Ileo inguinal nerve, it supplies the scrotum and the groin and then sympathetic nerves. And uh, so it contains three nerves, 
and three arteries. Three arteries like testicular artery, which is arising from the aorta because testis they develop in the region of the abdomen and later through this canal, they will go to their uh, current location. Then artery to the vast difference, which is from inferior vesicular artery and then chemistaric artery, which is from the inferior epigastric artery. So lymphatics, they will uh, drain to the para-aortic nodes because it is taking its origin and blood supply from that area. So they will drain pampini from venous plexus. They will also drain processus vaginaris, which is the obliterated peritoneal connection with the tunica vaginaris of the testes. The incarnate ligament, it serves as a landmark for the pouring, like the tendon of Cross major and the femoral branch of the genitofemoral nerve both may pass under the inguinal ligament. The long septus vein terminates in the femoral vein about 3 cm below the inguinal ligament. The external iliac nodes, uh, the external iliac becomes a common femoral artery at the inguinal ligament. The superficial epigastric vein passes in front of the inguinal ligament. The mid inguinal point lies halfway between the anterior superior iliac spine and pubic tubercle. The femoral artery crosses into the lower limb at this anatomical landmark. So then we have to talk about the anatomy of the female pelvis. So Doctor, can be right? Yeah. Uh, I want a uh, prayer for us, sir. The time goes. Okay, you know, yeah, just one second. I will tell you one thing that you know, we have finished this abdominal wall and everything, so I think we can stop here and uh, I will tell you about the next session because um, maybe it will take us uh, like two sessions because otherwise it has like 65 pages, it will take a very long time. Okay, so I will, and so maybe I will take your class on Tuesday. Or Wednesday, I will let you know about that. And then the test will be on Thursday. But the test will be next week. Okay. That is the point. Um, so okay. Yeah, just All right. Um, no, you want to say something? Please tell me.